Hi everyone, welcome to this free bubble pain society webinar number nine. Um, in this series where we ask the experts to answer your questions. I'm Sharon Goldbear, trustee of the Bubble Pain Society and pain science educator. We've covered a range of topics, disciplines over the last eight weeks. Um, please email info at vulvalpainsociety.org if you'd like to find out more about what we've covered or like access. So you've asked us to continue these webinars. So we asked you to um, choose the topics. Today, menopausal wellness and pelvic health. Now, before we meet our expert, uh, let me tell you, as usual, we have Kay Thomas from the VPS in the Q&A chat boxes. Many of you entered a question when registering. So we're gonna see whether we can get to answering as many as possible. There's a lot to get through. We do tend to get a mountain of questions, but this time, interestingly, there's a real variety of questions that have come in. It's, it's really astounding. So it kind of points to the, the complexity of what we're covering today. Um, so look, this is probably going to be part one of a series when it comes to menopause. Um, if a question comes up as a result of something that is mentioned, then do type in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll see whether we can cover it if we're not already going to cover it. Um, the other thing I will say is if something comes up and you have a personal or a professional experience that might help someone else, you can type that in the chat box and everyone will be able to see that. So completely up to you. So familiarize yourself with the two boxes, the Q&A boxes if you want a question answered, the chat box if you think you've got some experience that might help someone else. So we talked about the complexity of this area. So I'm really excited to introduce our expert today, someone who doesn't treat just a symptom or a body part, but the whole woman. Um, I love this. You're a true proponent of the biopsychosocial model of health. Women's health physio, you've got a knowledge of nutrition, herbal medicine, mindfulness, yoga, so much more. Michelle Lyons, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. So excited about this. Um, before we get into the questions, I'm going to run a poll to see um, who's with us today. Um, so if you, and this is um, multi-option, so you can pick more than one, Mary, Mary, Mary? perimenopausal, <laughs> menopausal, just want to plan ahead, healthcare professional or other. So as that um, come, those results come in, um, just to say some of the questions you sent in might be more appropriate for a medical doctor to answer. So we'll kind of set those aside for the future. Um, Michelle, as those results come in, tell us a little bit about you and your day-to-day -day work. Sure. So um, I qualified as a physio 27 years ago at this point. Um, it feels like 150 years ago sometimes. But um, I've been working in women's health really for the past 20 years. Um, and it started with, you know, I, my career started out in sports medicine and orthopedics, but with the daughter of my, uh, with the birth of my daughter um, 20 years ago, I didn't have a great obstetric experience and I thought we have to do better by women and, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah. So I changed career direction and really became very passionate about all aspects of women's health because women's health is you know, there's a, there's a certain phrase when we talk about women's health, bikini medicine, and it really just, you know, tries to compartmentalize women's health into breasts and pelvic health. And I think that's really doing women a disservice. We have to look at the whole woman, her story, her history, how she's doing, you know, what's brought her to this point in her life, how she's living her life. And then, of course, what we can do to, to help her live that life better um, and to really improve her quality of life. So, I think, you know, we have to look at all the different aspects of health, physical health, certainly. What's she eating? How's she feeling? How's she exercising? What, does she have pain? What are her physical and mental stressors that are going on? What's her healthcare journey been like up until now? What are her main issues and problems and, you know, desires for, for living well? And so I really have focused over the past number of, of years on building out a toolbox that's hopefully going to take a lot of those boxes for women 
And for most of the past 10 years, I've uh, been teaching at a postgrad level on women's health. So going back and forth to the US and Canada and Australia, the UK, um, with the delights of a global pandemic, I'm putting more and more of those uh, informational and educational resources online. Mm. And I collaborate with, with my good friend Jenny Burrell in the UK, and we've put together a number of different courses that really try to look at the health of the whole woman. Um, body and soul because i think if we're just looking at one body part in isolation again we're not getting the big picture so we can zoom in and be really specialist but we want to be able to zoom out and see the whole woman as well mm. yeah brilliant um and the poll results are, are, are in so we've got um 24 perimenopausal 29 menopausal um, eleven percent just want to plan ahead. Love it. Um, healthcare professionals, forty-seven percent. Um, and then other. Now, if you want to tell us what that other means, that's fifteen percent is other. So, if you want to let us know what that means, you can definitely type in the in the chat box <laughs> and let us know. Um, so, we've got a split between patients and clinicians here. It seems. Um, so should we dive into some of these some of these questions um, and as we start you know can we distinguish between perimenopause menopause how do you know that you're starting either one or transitioning from one to the other so the thing about menopause is technically menopause just lasts a second because menopause literally means it's been 12 months since you've had a period. So you don't know you've been through menopause until a year later. So mm. if you've had a period and then you've had 12 months without, without bleeding, technically you are in menopause. Um, perimenopause, on the other hand, is that, you know, for some women, it's just a couple of years. For some women, it's up to 15 years of the buildup to that snapshot of time. Uh, where you, it's been 12 months since you've had a period. And that's when a lot of this is going on with our hormones. They're up and down. We're trying to figure things out. But generally, you know, worldwide, the average age of menopause for women is 51. So if we go 15 years back from that, if you're over 35, for yeah. most women, you're in that perimenopausal zone. Um, so mm -hmm. it's really menopause itself like i said it's just a blip but it's perimenopause and then of course postmenopause because we're going to live somewhere between a third and maybe even up to half our life after menopause depending on what age we are when we have it so our job is really to make sure that women are living well during and after menopause and that we're using all the different tools at women's disposal you know to to really take charge of their own health i'm a big believer that knowledge is power yeah. um and by having really open, frank discussions hmm. about issues that might have been taboo in the past, like menopause, you know, when we used to just refer to it as the change, yeah. you know, <laughs> Shh. Um, and just to be able to, you know, this is, it's not a medical problem. It's hmm. a normal life transition, but we have to look at the context in which it's occurring. What's going on, nutrition, movement, stress, sleep wise, Hormonal, hormonally balanced wise, and what can we do to improve the situation if it needs improving? Okay. So in terms of preparing mm. for menopause, <laughs> um, we've got questions on, on preparing, and of course there are the people you know watching today who are thinking ahead. Should we start preparing for menopause before we enter the menopausal years? Can anything help prepare? Absolutely. Absolutely. So a couple of things that we can do to ensure a good transition through and beyond the menopause. And I would say one of the most important things that you can do for yourself as a woman at any life stage is to prioritize your self-care. And it's one of those things that's really easy to say and quite difficult to do sometimes. But if you are bringing an element of mindfulness to every decision that you're making, then the dominoes will line up behind that as much as possible. So making good choices about the food that you're eating, you know, um, about your stress management. I think that's absolutely vital for hormonal balance. 
because when we're approaching that menopausal switch, um, you know, we really want to think about, yes, we've got declining levels of estrogen and progesterone, but your body has other reservoirs that it can convert these base hormones into weaker types of estrogen as well. So as ovarian production slows down, our other avenues of hormone production have the capacity to ramp up a little bit. Mm. But if those building blocks are being diverted into the production of stress hormones instead, then we have nothing left in the tank for that conversion. So that's really important. Self-care, stress management. I would say sleep is essential. It's a really yeah. essential part of good hormonal balance. Mm. Um, and movement is just non-negotiable once you're, once, I think once you're a woman, first of all, but certainly once you're in perimenopause, movement is absolutely non-negotiable because when we go through menopause, we lose, estrogen has about 300 different functions in the female body, but a couple of its really important wow. functions are, of course, pelvic health, but heart health, brain health, and bone health. And what we know is that there's a huge body of evidence to show that lifestyle approaches like sleep and stress management and nutrition, but primarily exercise and strength training especially jumps out as being protective for your brain, your heart and your bones. And I think, you know, there's also some interesting evidence that it's very protective for your mental health as well. Mm -hmm. So those are really the big rocks of living well, coming up to and beyond menopause. You know, how are you managing your stress is a huge one because if you are diverting those building block hormones to stress hormones, that's one thing, you're not going to sleep well. Mm. That can lead to heart problems, but that can also lead to weight gain. Um, it can lead to pelvic health issues as well because our pelvic floor muscles are such a psychologically responsive mm -hmm. part of our body. Hmm. So if we're feeling tension or anxiety or fear, we're going to carry that in our pelvis as well. Mm -hmm. So if you can get those four building blocks, if you can give those four your attention, you're in a really good position mm -hmm. to, to start taking charge of your perimenopausal journey. Okay. Good advice. Great. <laughs> um, so diving into a few more of these questions, um, can you have signs and symptoms that are typically associated with menopause, but not be in menopause because you still have your period? Absolutely, especially once you're in your 30s, because that's when we start to notice some changes. And I think particularly what we're seeing now is that women are having babies later in life as well. So it's not unreasonable to, um, to assume, to acknowledge that there are many women who are both postnatal and perimenopausal at the same time. And that's a right. huge challenge mm. for, for all the systems in their bodies as well. I think in the past, maybe, a lot of issues that women have had at midlife were blamed on the menopause. Um, it was just this, this catch-all for everything that was going wrong with you. And I don't accept that as, as a good enough strategy for helping women. I think we have to be able to look a little bit deeper. You know, sometimes thyroid dysfunction can mimic some of the symptoms that we associate with menopause, like brain fog or hair loss or hot flushes. So I think we have to really look deeper for answers and make sure that we are, we're not getting the brush off or being yeah. told to go home and have a glass of wine and relax. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that we can advocate for ourselves as women and that we educate ourselves and we're able to, to say, I, I want some answers as to what's going on. Mm. Having said that, that doesn't mean that you abdicate responsibility to a pharmaceutical, mm. you know, that you really do have to take responsibility for doing the work yourself on those lifestyle aspects that you can control as much as possible. And those lifestyle aspects, you talked about movement. Um, and there's a question here, is there a connection between the menopause and increased vulnerability to aches and pains and muscle strains? Absolutely, I'm so glad wow. you asked that. So we talked about the hundreds of different things that estrogen can do 
And one of the things that estrogen has a huge influence over, as well as bone health, is actually muscle and tendon health. So lots of women going through menopause start to notice aches and pains, their shoulders, their hips, their feet, their back. And we see this actually even more so in women who are going through breast cancer treatment, who are maybe on estrogen reduction strategies like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. They can really get some, some strong muscle and joint problems. Yeah. And again, you know, I'm such a one trick pony here, but the answer actually is a specific exercise strategy. So we know that, say, for example, women in their 50s, one in four women in their 50s will develop an issue called gluteal tendinopathy, which basically means you're going to start having some problems with the tendons around your hips. And oftentimes this is misdiagnosed as hip arthritis, but it's a tendon problem. And tendons love estrogen and they, they really don't like changes in their environment or changes in activity. So if you're a woman in your 50s, what happens around midlife as well as our, our metabolism changes a little bit, the things that we could get away with eating in our 20s are possibly not as well tolerated in our 50s, we put on a little bit of weight and maybe we go gung-ho into a new exercise program and we can develop just little strains and aches and pains and then we think, oh, so exercise is bad for me. I'm going to stop doing that because now it's hurting me. So the key is to find the right type of exercise for mm. where you are in life. But we have really lovely evidence showing that for these women who have this gluteal tendinopathy, and again, one in, one in four women in their 50s are going to develop this, we need to have women who are capable of seeking an accurate diagnosis, first of all, whether it's from their physio or their GP, and then getting the help they need to take care of themselves. But we see issues with shoulders, with rotator cuff issues, plantar fasciitis. So, yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that your tendons do miss having estrogen around, but there's a lot that we can do to help them out, to help them stay strong and supple. And, you know, motion is lotion. Physios, we, have, we love good cliches around exercise, <laughs> so I apologize in advance. But really, it's, it's how we keep our bodies happy and healthy. And again, the evidence is really starting to build up that it's how we keep our, our minds happy and healthy as well. Yeah. And I love that phrase, motion is lotion, um, because really it, it's kind of telling you that it's no one exercise. It's whatever suits you, whatever movement suits you. And whatever you like. Doing yeah, it now. absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's key. Because if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it. No, exactly. Um, <laughs> So oestrogen having lots of different functions in the body, is there a connection between menopause and um, the activation of autoimmune diseases? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Mm. Um, the jury is still out to a degree mm. on that. But we do know that one of the key populations for, say, autoimmune uh, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, for example, women in their 40s in that perimenopausal zone, we know that stressors can be a driver of autoimmune flare-ups as well. Yeah. So depending on what your interpretation of going through menopause is as well, menopause can either be a cultural stressor for you or it can be a cultural joy. You know, if you look at the research from around the world in cultures that actually respect women as they get older, um, if you view menopause as a time where maybe you don't have to worry about birth control anymore, yeah. Um, that you're a little bit more free. Maybe the kids have left the house. Maybe you have the house and your partner to yourself. Maybe you've gotten rid of the partner as well and it's a whole new phase of life for you. I think a lot of that, you know, every thought that we have produces neuropeptides and every cell in your body is listening to the thoughts that you have. So there are definite physiological issues with autoimmune dysfunctions like rheumatoid arthritis but I think we can't discount the effect that psychological stressors, as well as nutrition and all the other things that are going on, but we definitely see autoimmune dysfunctions affecting across the board women more so than men. Mm. So I think there has to be some hormonal interplay there. Mm. Okay, all right. Mm. Um, question about hot flushes. Any tips to decrease them, alleviate them? Yes. So here's what the evidence tells us. 
that practicing mindfulness and using cognitive behavioral therapy can decrease the frequency and intensity of hot flushes by 46%. Wow. But I know, I mean, these are great numbers <laughs> and the side effects of, you know, compared to medication, the side effects are usually pretty good. Yeah. It's a matter of building up your mindfulness muscles though, because some people try mindfulness once and like, oh, it didn't work. I'm never doing it again. But you wouldn't go to the gym and lift a set of weight once and say, oh, my arms don't look like Michelle Obama's. What am I going to do? You know, <laughs> you have to do the work and build up your mindfulness muscles. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really strong evidence-based strategy. The other ones are giving up alcohol, um, coming up with a good sleep strategy. And again, to sound like a broken record, exercise has been shown to really help with your thermal regulation. Um, particularly cardiovascular exercise where you get your heart rate up a little bit it really seems to improve that temperature regulation so a combination of exercise stress management avoiding alcohol um, and then the usual dressing in layers um, making sure you're well hydrated is really important as well and that's one that we see as being a key issue around menopause as well because sometimes women might start to develop a little bit of bladder leakage as they go through menopause and they start restricting their fluid intake. And that's really disastrous in terms of pelvic health, but also in terms of your hot flush management. And what can be done for an overactive bladder? Well, I'm surprised that it's taken me this long to mention it because if anybody's watching this who's met me before, one of my very, very favorite things to talk about is constipation and constipation is one of the key drivers of overactivity in your bladder so for anybody you know who's going through any pelvic health issues one of the first things you want to try and do is deal with any constipation issues that you might be having um, and that can be driven by maybe some overactivity in the pelvic floor muscles are you eating enough fiber are you drinking enough water are you moving enough you know there's lovely mm. studies out there showing that even a 20 minute walk a day is beneficial in terms of addressing constipation. So mm. don't go straight for the pharmaceuticals when it comes to constipation. Try a little abdominal massage, some deep breathing. Um, again, look at your stress levels because the bowel and the brain love to talk to each other as well. And then go see if you can a women's health physio who's going to be able to assess your pelvic floor muscles because not everybody needs to strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. Most women actually don't need to strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. Mm -hmm. They need to learn to let them relax mm -hmm. and to reestablish some good coordination. But some women do need to strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. So going to see somebody who can do a proper assessment and yeah. come up with a bespoke plan for you is really essential for that. Mm -hmm. So for overactivity of the bladder, first step is get constipation under control get some coordination of the pelvic floor muscles, find out what's going on with yours. Look for any dietary irritants as well. Our friend alcohol and coffee are the two prime ones that we think of mm. when it comes to bladder irritants. But tea can also be a powerful bladder irritant as well. The tannins in tea can be a little bit irritating because another function of estrogen is to maintain that, that lining of the bladder, if you like, and keep it nice and elastic. And as our estrogen levels go down, the bladder can become a little bit less elastic and a little bit more irritable. So we want to just keep an eye for anything that is provoking a pattern of irritation in the bladder. For some people, it's fizzy drinks. For some people, it's sugar. But usually caffeine, tea and alcohol are the big ones that we see.